Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with cheese and potato stuffed flatbread. That's right, this easy bread is made without yeast or the use of an oven since we're going to roast it right in the pan. And if you enjoyed our kachapuri, which is a Georgian style cheese stuffed bread, and you love potato, this really should be the next thing you make. And the first thing we need for this is some cooked potato, which I'm going to get by roasting some russets. But before these go in the oven, we'll give them the old polka polka with the tip of a knife, which is going to help release some steam and moisture as these roast, which is going to make for a fluffier, drier texture. And once those have been poked, we'll go ahead and pop those in the center of a 400 degree oven for about an hour or until they're very tender, as tested with a knife, which should slide in with no effort. And then what we'll do is cover these with a towel and just let them cool all the way down to room temp before we scoop those out into a bowl. And while those are cooling, we can move on to make this very simple, very fast, fun to work with dough. And for that, we'll take some all-purpose flour and we'll make a little well in the center with a fork into which we'll pour some milk, as well as a little bit of cold, fresh water, followed by a nice big pinch of salt. And then we'll take our fork and start stirring this. And we will keep stirring until everything eventually comes together to form what we call in the business a shaggy dough. And no, we did not forget the yeast. All right, I'm doing the unleavened version of this bread. But in case you're wondering, this will work with a bread dough or a firmer pizza dough. I just happen to prefer the simpler, easier version. But anyway, once we've achieved a shaggy dough, which looks exactly like it sounds, we will stop and add the last ingredient, which is some melted butter. And we'll continue mixing it until it all comes together. And once we eventually have something that looks like this, we can stop stirring with the fork and we will lightly flour our hand and we can start kneading this right in the bowl. And in a relatively short time, that should come together into a ball and all the flour from the side should be absorbed. And as usual, if it seems super dry, you can add a few more drops of water or if it seems too wet, add a little bit of flour. But to me, this was feeling just about perfect. And once we're happy with it, we can transfer that to the work surface. And we'll dust over just a little bit of flour, and then we'll give that one final kneading for about a minute until we end up with a smooth, relatively stiff, very slightly elastic ball of dough. And by the way, thanks to the butter and the relatively low hydration, this is a very easy dough to work with. So if you're kind of a beginner, this is a perfect one to practice with. And that's it since we're not using yeast. Once our ball of dough is formed, it's technically ready to use but for best results, I think we should wrap it and let it rest for about 15 to 30 minutes, which is perfect since while that's happening, we can finish our filling, which will start with one cup of cooked potatoes, which as you saw, I roasted. But if you wanted, you could boil yours and then mash it or even use some leftover mashed potatoes. But for me, for this, the drier the potato, the better. And I think scooped out baked potatoes gives us the best results. But either way, to that we will add some salt, as well as some freshly ground black pepper. And then we'll take the fork and give this a little bit of a mash. And how smooth and fine you do this is going to be up to you. But personally, I don't want a perfectly smooth puree. Plus, we're also going to be mixing and mashing in a few more ingredients. So I'm going to go ahead and stop right here, with it still being a little bit coarse. And I'm going to add a couple optional ingredients, which would be some freshly sliced green onions as well as some finely diced hot green chilies. And once that's in, we'll move on to the non-optional ingredients, which will be some mozzarella cheese that I diced instead of grated, just so they're in bigger pieces, which I think is better for the texture. Plus, I like to add a little bit of sharp cheddar, since the cheese they used back in the old country has the texture sort of like a mozzarella, but it has a tangier, sharper flavor. So we'll add a little bit of that to compensate. And then last but not least, we will crumble in a generous amount of feta, or right, ideally something on the dry and sort of salty and kind of funky side. And do not, under any circumstances, buy it pre-crumbled. Okay, it's just not as good. And for even the world's worst, slowest cheese crumbler, that is only going to take like 30 seconds. Plus, afterwards, you get to lick it off your fingers, which is always a treat. But anyway, once that's been fetted, we'll take our fork and mix everything together, and once it's been evenly combined, if we want, we can kind of mash it a little bit with the fork. Although, as I mentioned earlier, I do like to retain a little bit of texture. 
and don't necessarily want this perfectly smooth. And once we feel like that's been mixed enough, we can start pressing that down with the back of our fork to form a nice compact disc in the bottom of the bowl, which if we wanted to, we could just refrigerate like this until it's ready to stuff our dough. But to make that step a little bit easier, what I like to do is transfer that onto a piece of plastic and then gather up the sides and wrap it nice and tightly so we can give it a final shaping with our hands. Since the tighter this is packed and the more uniform the shape is at this point, the easier the final step is gonna be. So after wrapping and shaping, we'll go ahead and pop that in the fridge and then we'll take our now rested dough and we'll transfer that onto a well floured surface and then using enough flour so it doesn't stick, we will roll this out into a circle about 10 inches wide. And as you'll see, I like to flip this over and reflower a few times so that we're sure our dough is not gonna stick to the surface. Since if that happens, it makes the wrapping our filling step much, much harder. Of course, having said that, don't overdo it. Since when it comes to doughs, we never wanna add more flour than we need. But anyway, like I said, we will roll that out until it's about 10 inches wide. And in case you're wondering, mine was exactly 10 and a half inches. And I know you're not here for the math, but what that means is if we take our filling, which we formed into a disc about five inches wide, and we place that in the center, that gives us about two and a half inches of extra dough with which to fold up over the top, sort of pleating it just like I'm doing here. Oh, and by the way, I have a little bit of water nearby, which I'm dipping my fingers into once in a while because eventually we want all this dough sealed together. So as those folds meet in the middle, I'm using some moist fingertips to kind of press it together. And if everything goes according to plan, once that last piece gets folded up over, we should have complete coverage. And then once that's been accomplished, we will dust this side generously with flour and then flip it over and we'll give it a little bit of a press with our hands. Okay, to flatten it out a little bit and to make sure we're maintaining a nice round shape, and then what we'll do after dusting this with a little more flour is grab our rolling pin and we will gently but very confidently roll this out until it's about an inch thick. And yes, if you use some diced peppers like I did, those may look like they're trying to poke through the surface, but they won't, or at least they shouldn't. And during this process, I do like to flip it over and flour and roll both sides, mostly to make sure that bottom's sealed and it's not sticking to the table. But once this is about an inch thick, and we're done rolling, we do want to end up with the seams on the bottom, since that's the side we're gonna place down into the pan first. So we will very carefully slide our hand under, and we'll transfer this into a well-buttered, non-stick skillet set over medium heat. And the reason we wanna cook this relatively gently on medium is because we're gonna need plenty of time for that dough to cook through, and for that filling to come up to temperature and our cheese to melt. And if the pan's too hot, the surface might burn before all that happens. So we'll start on medium and adjust from there. And then once that's been transferred in and we're happy with our heat, we will cover that and let it cook for five minutes or until the bottom is a light golden brown. And yes, we're allowed to peek. We just wanna be a little bit careful. And that's it, after about five minutes, we can go ahead and flip that over, which I am dreadfully sorry happened out of the frame. All right, I tossed that up too high to see. Since I've always found things at zero gravity easier to flip, but anyway, we'll flip that just like a big old fat pancake. Or if you're scared, just slide it onto a plate and then place another plate over and invert it and slide it right back into the pan. That also works. It's just not quite as thrilling. In any event, we'll cover that back up and we'll cook the other side for five minutes, at which point we'll uncover and flip it back over. Once again, not in the frame. And because the pan was a little bit hotter than when we first put it in, that second side's probably going to be a little bit darker and even more gorgeous. I mean, come on, look at that. I want to eat it right now, but we can't. Let's give that seam side another couple minutes, just so we're sure everything's cooked. And while that's happening, it is traditional to brush over a little more butter, because I guess with half a pound of cheese, this is not going to be rich enough. But anyway, it is traditional, so I'm going to do it. And I'm pretty sure you will as well. And if we did a good job wrapping this, and we didn't trap a bunch of air pockets inside, we should not have any problem with this bursting. But to hedge our bets, if we want, we can take the tip of a knife and make a little vent hole in the top, which will release any built up steam. But anyway, whether we vent or not, after giving that first side a couple more minutes, we'll go ahead and pull that off the heat. 
and transfer that onto a plate or a cutting board where we will let it cool for about five minutes while we grab whatever we're going to serve this with, which for me is going to be a hot honey, which is simply some honey with some chili flakes mixed in. And then I finished up with a few freshly sliced green onions. And that's it. Once that's cooled for a few minutes, we can grab a pizza wheel and cut this up. Or if we have one, we can use a mezzaluna, which is just about the most fun cutting utensil ever invented. And I'm going to go ahead and cut this into six portions. And I know those pieces aren't exactly the same size, but neither are my guests. And that's it. I'm going to grab a piece and take a bite, as is, without the honey, so I can taste that pure cheese and potato goodness. And that, my friends, is just insanely delicious. Okay, for a cheese and potato fanatic like me, it does not get any better than this. And no, I did not need to cut this piece in half. I just really wanted to use that mezzaluna again. Man, that feels good. But anyway, the combination of that crispy, buttery crust and that soft, cheesy, potatoey filling that we upgraded with those green onions and peppers is pretty much perfection. And then if and when you combine it with that sweet heat from that chili-infused honey, it takes this to a whole other place, which is definitely a place I love to be, and I think you will too. In fact, if we serve this with the honey, I think it turns it into the perfect breakfast or brunch item. But having said that, if you're not into hot honey, I can think of about 10 things off the top of my head that this would be perfect dipped into. Oh, and as far as other variations go, there are so many other things you can add in. Okay, I've seen this done with mushrooms and herbs and different kinds of peppers. So please, as usual, feel free to be creative. I mean, you are after all the riot rows of how this goes. And speaking of new additions to the family, no matter what you put in this, I think this will make a fabulous new addition to your family's recipe repertoire, which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.